Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In this video, I will teach you everything you need to know to get started coding in Python and becoming a programming wizard. Python is beginner friendly. It's easy to learn, read, and write code in. Coding in Python is powerful and super easy compared to other programming languages out there. Python is one of the most popular programming languages and sought after for jobs. So if you want to automate different parts of your life, create cool scripts to show off to your friends, or get a job in the industry, then Python is for you. First off, Python is a popular high-level programming language that's used for a wide range of applications. Some of these are web development, data analysis, and artificial intelligence. Python is known for its simplicity and readability which makes it a great language for beginners. In order to get started on your journey to being a Python wizard, we'll need to install Python and then install an editor to write and run Python code. First up, we'll go to the official Python website and download the latest version of Python. So you can see here, we've gone to python.org slash downloads. And as you can see here at the top, there's a button saying download Python 3.11.2. That is the latest version as of this recording. So we'll go ahead and click on this, and once it finishes installing, we can open it up. So from here, what we're gonna do is add python.exe to path. If you don't do this, you won't be able to run Python in the command line. Let's go ahead and do that, and we'll customize our installation. And for us, we'll just have to leave all these checked. We'll go ahead and click next. From here, we'll go ahead and just check these first two boxes, and we'll go ahead and click install. There'll be a pop-up on Windows. From here, you just want to click yes. It will start installing. It might take a little bit to download. All right, and from here, we have successfully downloaded Python. We'll go ahead and close this. Now we'll go ahead and install an editor to write and run Python code. I personally like VS Code with all the features and plugins that it has, so I highly recommend it. So now we'll go ahead and go to the official Visual Studio Code website. And in here, you select your operating system. For me, it's Windows. So we'll go ahead and click Download. It should pop in the top right. And then whenever this is done, we'll go ahead and open it. All right, and now that it's finished installing, we can go ahead and go through the setup process. So we'll go ahead and just accept the agreement. Pretend like we read everything. Go ahead, next. You can go ahead and select the location of it. Uh, where it's at right now is fine. So I'm just going to hit Next. And then this is fine, we can just hit next. And for these, we're gonna check all the boxes. Uh, we wanted to create the desktop icon and then adding these two options will allow us in the file explorer to right click and open with code for any files or folders there. So go ahead and hit next and we'll go ahead and install. Okay, and once it's finished installing, we'll make sure this is checked and we'll hit finish and it will load up Visual Studio Code. From here, we can select the settings. Uh, you can browse color themes, but I just like the dark one, so I'm gonna go with that one. Go to next, next. Let's go ahead and mark done. All right, and from here, we now have Visual Studio Code set up. Now we will set it up for Python. So we'll go ahead and zoom in here with Control Plus a couple times, and we'll go ahead and click these little boxes for extensions. So we'll come over here and search extensions. We'll just search Python. There's a group of extensions right here with the Python extension pack. And it'll give us Python, IntelliCode, uh, and some other stuff that's really useful. So we'll go ahead and install that. And while that's installing, there's another extension I'd like to grab real quick. We'll go ahead and material icons right here. This one will just change the icons of the folders and files, and it makes it look a lot nicer. We'll go ahead and install that too. And then we'll go ahead and set it right here. And now that's all set up and we have the extensions installed. So we can go ahead and go back over here to the Explorer. Yeah, we'll go ahead and go file. We'll go new file. I'm going to create a Python file. Just to make sure everything works here, we're going to type print, open and close parentheses. Then we're going to use single quotes or double quotes. It doesn't matter. We're just going to type hello. Now we'll save it and it's going to ask us where to save it. Right, and you can pick any file location. I went ahead and just picked the location and I'm naming it tutorial1.py. Make sure for all the Python files you end it with .py and we'll go ahead and hit save. 
All right, and from here, we're gonna go ahead and zoom in a couple more times so we can see a little more clearly. So we're gonna go ahead and click this little play button up here to run our program. And you can see it ran it and printed out, hello. Now you're ready to begin your journey to become an expert in Python. Today, we're gonna be learning about several of Python's data types and about variables. So every program needs data to work with and Python is no exception. In Python, we can work with several different data types. We will go over the data types of integers, floats, strings, and booleans. There are several more, but we will learn about those in the future. So first up, we have integers, which are just whole numbers. Then we have floats, which are numbers with decimal places. Then we have strings, which are any characters that are wrapped around single or double quotes. And then we have booleans, which are just true or false values. These are the most common data types used in Python. So now that we know some of Python's data types, let's go ahead and start making some variables. To do this, we will go ahead and choose a name for our variable and assign a value to it using the equal sign. So for example, we'll make a variable called variable and we'll set it equal to one. So there are a few different ways you can name variables. One is to do all lowercase like I just did here. You can make all of the characters capitalized if you want to. You can even put underscores in the variable name and you can also add numbers to it if you want to as well. There are some rules to naming variables in Python. Uh, for example, you cannot start a variable name with a number. As you can see in my editor, it gives an error. You also can't use any dashes in the variable. And you also can't use emojis in the variable name either. So for Python, a variable name must start with a letter or an underscore. A variable name can only contain alphanumeric characters and underscores. A variable name cannot be any of the Python keywords. Well, technically it can, but it might cause issues in your code, so it's better to stay away from them. There are different ways to name your variables as well. One way to name a variable in Python is using snake case, which means between each word that you have in the variable name, you put an underscore. Another way to name a variable in Python is using camel case, which instead of using underscores, you just capitalize the next letter in the variable name. Another common way to name variables is using Pascal case, which is capitalizing the first character of each word in your variable name. I personally use snake case when I'm coding in Python. I hear that's the best practice for Python, but it really doesn't matter which naming convention you use as long as you keep it consistent throughout your code. It is worth noting that it's important to name your variable something meaningful to describe what you're trying to do with it or what kind of data it's trying to hold. So naming variables as just a, B, not very descriptive for what they're doing. If you have a very big program, you can get kind of confused to what the variable is doing or what kind of data it's holding. An example of this is let's say we have a number X equals four and a number Y equals two. You can see we do have num in the beginning of both of these. So we know what kind of data this variable will hold. So any variables containing number values, we can do any arithmetic operators on it. So we can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And so an example of this is we have a variable name result, which is adding num x and num y together. And we're gonna go ahead and print it with Python's print function. So whenever we go ahead and click this little play button up here to run the file, we'll print the result of six, which is four and two added together. And we can just go ahead and replace this addition with multiplication. So adding a star and we run it. And now we get eight multiplying four and two together. And we also have float values here. So here we've declared a variable called float one and we've set it to 3.14159. And now we've declared a variable float two and set it equal to 2.11111. And we'll go ahead and use the print statement again to add these numbers together. Whenever we run it, we get 5.2527. So for strings, there are different ways to initialize a string variable. One is we can just have single quotes here wrapped around a bunch of characters. Another way is we can have double quotes wrapped around the characters. We can even use triple quotes to have multi-line strings. So for example, we take string two and we add press enter. It then produces a syntax error. But if we go to our triple quotes and we press enter, you can see there is no syntax error because it considers this the beginning of the string and this the end of the string. And we can do the same thing with triple quotes. So in Python, we can use the plus operator to add strings together. 
So for example, we use the print function and we'll take string one and add an exclamation point to it. So now if we run it, we get hello world with the exclamation point added at the end. Another cool thing we can do with strings is we can do multiplication on it with numbers. So if we take string one and multiply it by three, it will actually print out that string three times. So here we've declared a variable called boolean and we set it equal to true. These are mainly used for conditional statements. So if this variable is true, then we'll do something. If it's false, then we'll do something else. We'll go more into if statements a little later on in conditionals. All right, so I have a challenge for you. We have this variable name value and we are setting it equal to 13. What is the type of this variable? Let me know in the comments below if you know. And that's it for the introduction to data types and variables in Python. Remember, Python has many more data types and operators to work with, but these basics should give you a good foundation to start building your programs. In this video, we'll be discussing what lists are, how to create them, and some of the basic things you can do with them. So what is a list in Python? A list is a collection of elements which can be of any type, such as integers, strings, booleans, or even other lists, and more. Lists are one of the most versatile and useful data structures in Python, and they allow us to store and manipulate data in a variety of ways. They are mutable data structures, which means we can modify the data they hold, individual elements can be replaced, and other elements can be changed even after the list has been created. And if you are coming from other programming languages, lists are very similar to arrays. So let's get started by creating a simple list in Python. We will go ahead and declare our variable name numbers here. And to create a list, use the open and close square brackets, or you can type list with open and close parentheses. This will create an empty list. But for now, we're just gonna go with the open and close brackets so we can add some values in there. Each element in a list will be separated by commas. So whatever we wanna put in here, we'll go ahead and put a bunch of numbers. So we'll do one, two, three, four, and five. There are five elements in this list and they're all separated by a comma. And this is how you create a list in Python. So that's cool and all, but what can we do with it? Well, we can access individual elements of the list using their index, which is their position. List indexes are from left to right, starting from the number zero. For example, if we want to access the first element of the numbers list, we use the index zero like this. This will give us the first value in this list here. So we can go ahead and use the built-in print function in Python and run it, and we get the number one, which is the first element in our list. We can also use negative indices to access elements from the end of the list. For example, to access the last element in the list, we will just type negative one. If we increase to, let's say, negative two, it will give us the second to the last element in the list, and so on. We can also assign new values to the index in the list. For example, if we type in numbers of zero, which is the first index, and we set it equal to whatever value we want to. So let's just say new number here. Then we go ahead and print out our list. You can see that it did replace the first element of one right here with our string of new number. If you try to put an index that is larger than the amount of elements in the list, it will actually throw an error. So if we put 99 here and we go ahead and run it. It does throw an index error because the list assignment index is out of the range of the list. And the list only has five elements in it. So if we try to access the 99th, it will throw an error. Another cool thing we can do with lists is we can do something called slicing. And slicing is where we can take a subset of the list, do other operations on it, or we can assign new values using the list subset. So an example of this is when we go into the square brackets accessing the list, we can specify a start and an end index. The start index is inclusive, meaning it will get the value at that index. And the end index is exclusive, meaning it will not get the actual value at that index. It gets the value right before that. So here's an example. We'll say zero followed by a colon, and we can say two. And then whenever we go ahead and run it, we can see it gets a subset of our actual numbers list of one and two. Even though it's accessing indexes zero through two, which here it's zero, one, and two, since this is exclusive for the second value, we're only getting these first two. Another thing we can do with this is since we know we're returning a list of size two with two elements, we can now assign it a new list of let's say 
9, and 7. And if we go ahead and run it, we're actually replacing the first two values with our new values. Another thing is if you don't provide a start and end index, then it will just return the entire list. This is really useful for making copies of the list, so you can then do other modifications to it. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out the entire list down here. But another cool thing is we can actually provide the step value, which is essentially saying after that first value you get, how many values should we go through before we get the next one? So an example of this is if we add another colon and we add like a number two, and we go ahead and run it, we can see that it does print out the list of one, three, and five. So it does get this first value and then it takes two steps. So it goes one, two, gets that third value, and then it goes one, two, and gets that value. If we were to change this to three and we go ahead and run it, it only puts out one, four, because it's one, and then one, two, three, it gets this value, and then there's not another value after that that's in the third step. Another cool thing is if you were to put a negative number in here, you can actually flip the list around. So if we take this and we put a negative one, we can go ahead and run it and we get the list in reverse order. It's a really easy way to reverse a list in Python. And we can specify some other numbers. So say like we want to take the fourth index all the way to the second index. And we'll go ahead and run it and we do just get the values of five and four. Because zero, one, two, three, four starts right here and goes down to three and then two. But since this is exclusive, it does not include this value and we only get four and five. Another cool thing is lists aren't only limited to one data type. We can actually specify strings or even other lists inside this list. So for example, we can make another list with one, two, and three in the fourth position. And if we do go and run it, we can see that it does print out this extra list in here, along with our string value of three. And this isn't limited to just lists. We can use other data types that we'll talk about in later videos. So another cool thing is we can see if values are in a list using the in keyword in Python. So for example, if we take one in numbers, we can see if this value of one is inside our numbers list. If we go ahead and run it, we do see that it does return true. If we were to take this and say, is negative one in this list, and we run it, we say it returns false. This will be used more for conditions later on, but just something useful to know for now. Another cool thing we can do with lists is append or add elements to the end of them. To add an element to the end of the list, we can use the append method. We'll just type dot append. We can put whatever else we want in here. So we'll just go ahead and put six. And whenever we run it, you can see our list is now one through six instead of just one through five. So we added the number six to the end of our list. We can also insert an element at a specific index using the insert method. So instead of append right here, we'll type insert. And the first argument you pass to it is the position in the list that you want to insert it. So for example, we'll pass the number two for index number two, and then we want to put the number six there. So whenever we run this, we get one, two, six, three, four, five. And that's because starting from zero on the left side, it's zero, one, index two that we just added it, three, four, five. We can also remove elements from a list using the remove method. So an example of how to do this is we'll type dot remove for our list and open and close parentheses. We'll type a number or whatever element we want to remove. So for this case, we'll remove the number three. And whenever we run it, we now have a list with one, two, four, and five. And you can see that three had gotten removed since that's what we removed. The remove method will remove the first occurrence of this. So for example, if we add another three at the end here and we run this, the second three is still there just because it only removes the first three. Another cool thing with lists is we can actually merge lists together by extending it. So for example, here, if we have a variable called other, and we make it equal to a list of six, seven, eight, and nine. We can then type numbers dot extend and this other list. And whenever we run it, it now has the new list from one through nine, combining both lists together. Lists also have a neat built-in feature where you can count the number of times an element is in a list.
So for this case, we have a variable called count, and we're setting it equal to numbers.count of three. This will return us the number of times a three appears in the list that we're trying to count. If we run this, this should print out two since there are two threes in our list, and you can see that it does. So another cool thing we can do is we can pop specific indexes of the list and get that value out. So for example here, we'll have a variable named remove element, and we'll set it equal to numbers.pop of position one, which is the second element in the list. And we'll go ahead and print out the element and the numbers, and we'll go ahead and run it. And you can see that it did remove the number two, which is in the first index of the list. And now our list does not have the element that was previously at position one. Another really handy feature is we can use the built-in length function that Python has to get the length of the list. Here's an example. We'll set a variable named length and set it equal to len, open and close parentheses of whatever it is we wanna put inside. So in this case, our list. And then we'll go ahead and print this out. And whenever we run it, we get the length of our numbers list is five, since there are five elements in there. So if we add another element in here, like six, and we run it again, we now get the length of it being six. In this video, we'll discuss what sets are, how to create them, and some of the basic things you can do with them. So first off, what is a set in Python? A set is an unordered collection of unique elements. Sets are very similar to lists, but they cannot contain duplicate elements. Sets are just like arrays from other programming languages, but only with unique items. Sets are one of the most powerful and useful data structures in Python, and they allow us to perform operations like intersection, union, and the difference between multiple sets. Let's go ahead and start off by creating a simple set in Python. So first off, we'll go ahead and create a set underscore one variable, and we'll set it equal to set. And this is one way that you can declare an empty set. But another way to declare a set is to use empty curly braces. Sets are comma separated for each value, so meaning if we did something like one, two, three, this will be declared as a set. So we'll go ahead and change this up into a fruit set with apple, banana, and orange. Now that we have a set, what can we do with it? Well, we can perform a variety of operations on the set. First up, we can add new items to the set. So we can have our fruit set, and we can type dot add, open and close parentheses, and the value that we want to add. So in this case, let's do grape. And then we will go ahead and print this fruit set with our added value in it. So whenever we go ahead and run it, we do get apple, grape, orange, and banana. And we can see our grape has been added into it. Now, if you try adding another element of the exact same kind, nothing will happen because sets can only have one of each value inside of it. And whenever we call this dot add method, it does update it in place, meaning that we don't have to reassign the value to it. So if this wasn't updated in place, we'd have to do something like fruit set equals fruit set dot add grape. But in this case, we don't need to since it does update in place. And if you do recall from the video about lists, when you have a list, you can index it using the open and close square brackets and putting an index or a range of indexes inside. So something like this to access the second element, since it goes 0, 1, 2. But whenever we try and run this, it actually does not work for sets because sets are not subscriptable, which means you cannot index them. So whatever you can do for lists having these open and closed square brackets does not work on a set. So if you do remember from lists, we could do something like fruit set of zero equals our new value and let's say grape. And if we go ahead and run it, we do get an error here because assigning by just getting the index value like in a list does not work with sets. So if we want to be able to add multiple elements to our set without having to call dot add each time, we can use the dot update method, which inside here will take a list of the items that we want to add to it. So whenever we go ahead and run it, we do get that new updated list with pair and kiwi added in there. And now we could change this to a set instead. And if we go ahead and run it, we do get the same output. And this update method does apply the change in place, meaning again, we don't have to reassign the value. So if you want to take out elements from our set, we can use the dot remove method. If we go and type dot remove open and close parentheses, we can then specify the element we want to remove. So in this case, we will remove the apple from the fruit set and we'll go ahead and run it. And we can see down here that we do just get banana and orange with no apple in it. This also does apply the change in place. 
If we do try to remove an element that's not currently in our set, it will return a key error. So we can go ahead and run this right here and we can see that there is a key error for the tomato since the tomato is not originally in our fruit set. So another cool thing we can do is we can actually copy a set using the dot copy method. So we can go ahead and make a variable called copy set and we'll set it equal to fruit set dot copy. And let's say in this copied set, we want to add strawberries to it. And we will go ahead and print out our fruit set in our copied set. And we can see that our copy set does have strawberries in it. And so this copy method does create a shallow copy of the original fruit set. And a shallow copy is just copying the reference to each item in the set instead of making a deep copy, which is completely duplicating all the values. But that is a concept for another video. Another cool thing we can do is we can find the intersection between two sets, which means we could find all the items that are in both sets. So we'll go ahead and declare a vegetable set and we'll set it equal to carrot, celery, and tomato. And then we will go ahead and print fruit set dot intersection of our vegetable set. And whenever we go ahead and run it, we can see there is no output and it is essentially an empty set because there is no value that is in both of the sets at the same time. And so if we were to add tomato to our fruit set and we go ahead and run it, we do get a set of just tomato since that is in both of our sets. We can also use the union method to find the unique values from both sets. So instead of intersection, if we type union and we go ahead and run it, and you can see it is a combined set of all the values here. Similarly, we can find the difference between two sets by using the dot difference method. So we go ahead and do fruit set dot difference of our vegetable set and we go ahead and run it. And you can see we get all of the values that are in fruit set, but not in the vegetable set. So apple, banana, and orange are not in the vegetable set. And that's why we are getting it returned down here. And so another thing we can do with sets is we can actually convert from a list to a set back to a list to remove all of the duplicate values inside of a list. Let me show you an example. Here we have a variable my list and it is equal to a list of three zeros, three ones, and three twos. Now let's say there's a case where you want to find all unique values in a list. And so we'll go ahead and print out this list. So whenever we run it, we do see that it does print out our list full of all the zeros, ones, and twos. And so in this case, we'll go ahead and set our list equal to set open and close parentheses with our list passed in as an argument. This will convert our list into a set. So whenever we go ahead and run it again, you can see we do get a set of 0, 1, and 2. And since sets can't have duplicate values, this will find us all the unique values within our list. And so we can simply convert this back into a list by saying my list is equal to list of my list. This will convert the set back into a list. And whenever we go ahead and run it, now we get our list of just unique values without all the duplicates like we see above. And so we can write this a little bit shorter by simply calling list open parenthesis of set open parenthesis of my list and then close parenthesis respectively. And this will produce the same output. Another cool thing is we can see if elements are in a set just like in lists by using the in keyword. So we can go ahead and print apple in fruit set. And if we run it, we do get true since apple is in our fruit set. But if we did something like to see if our grape is in our fruit set, we go ahead and run it and we get false. Well, and that's a basic introduction to sets in Python. With sets, we can perform a variety of powerful operations and manipulate data in new and interesting ways. In this video, we'll be talking about tuples in Python and exploring some of the basic things you can do with them. So let's get started. In Python, a tuple is a collection of ordered and immutable elements, meaning the order won't change and you cannot add or remove elements once they have been created. Tuples are represented by parentheses and the elements are separated by commas. Let's take a look at an example. So here we can set my tuple equals to tuple of open and close parentheses. This will create an empty tuple for us. We can also create a tuple with values inside. So for example, we have fruits here equal to open parentheses and we have our string of apple followed by a comma, string of banana followed by a comma and string of orange. Now you can mix data types. So if you wanted to, we could say this is one. And we can say this could be true. And this is perfectly OK in Python. So here is an example of declaring a tuple in Python. So we can see here we have example one. 
our ex1 is equal to open and close parentheses of our string apple. And same thing down here, but there's a comma after it. So to declare a tuple, you need to have at least one comma to be considered a tuple. If not, it treats it as whatever type is in the parentheses instead of a tuple. So we can go ahead and print the type of our ex1 and type of ex2. And we can see that this first one, ex1, is a class string, and the second one is a class tuple. So just something to keep in mind when you're declaring tuples. Also, having parentheses on multiple lines like this is just a way for Python to know if something will be multiple lines. You can do something like this, have a multi-line variable equal to open and close parentheses of one, and we'll go ahead and run this with printing the type and the variable. And we can see it is an int and not a tuple. So we'll go ahead and use an example of fruits here that's equal to a tuple of apple, banana, and orange. And from here, we can get a specific element from this tuple by indexing. So to index, we need to open and close square brackets and the element that we want to index. So in this case, it starts from zero. So it goes zero, one, and two. And so for this, we're getting the position of one, which is the second element. So banana, we go ahead and run this. We can see that it does print banana. If we try to access an index that is too large, it will throw an error. So we go ahead and run it, getting position 99, and it throws an index error that the tuple index is out of range. Since there are not 100 elements in here, it will not let us get the 99. Another useful thing you can do with tuples is slicing, which means you can get a portion of it and not the entire thing. So from here, we can go from beginning to the end and don't include the last value since this first element in our slice is inclusive and the second element is exclusive, meaning it does not grab the value at that point. It just stops at the one before that. So we say the elements from zero to one, essentially, because it's not getting the second one. And whenever we go ahead and run this, it just prints apple and banana. So another thing is you can index with negative values. And so having this negative one just means going from the opposite direction. Interestingly enough, going the opposite direction starts with a one instead of a zero. Both of these will provide the same output. If we go ahead and run this, they both print out apple and banana. We can also reverse a tuple by starting at negative one, which is the last index, going all the way to zero and stepping backwards one at a time. So it starts over here at negative one. We want to get all the way over here to zero and it goes from negative one, back one, back one. Okay, we're at zero, we stop. We'll go ahead and run this. And you can see because we provided this zero here, it is exclusive and it's not including this apple. So it just goes orange and banana. If you wanted to include apple, you would just get rid of the zero here and leave it as a double colon. And if you run it again, it now prints all of them in reverse order. We can also get the length of a tuple by passing in the tuple into the length function. So we can go ahead and print the length of our fruits and this will print three. And you can see it right here. So as I mentioned earlier, tuples are immutable, which means once they are created, we cannot modify their elements. For example, let's say we try to change the second element in fruits to pear. Whenever we go ahead and run this, this code will produce an error because tuples cannot be modified after they are created. Another cool thing with tuples is you can have multiple assignment. So for example, we have the variables one and two setting equal to the tuple of one comma two. This will put each of the tuples in their respective variables. And we can see as we print one, we get one and two with two. If you add more variables to this and provide a star, it will group all of the elements that were not extracted. So in this case, this one was extracted into this one, and then everything else will be put into this two variable. So if we go ahead and run this. We can see that it turns it into a list of two, three, four, five. And this does work with lists, sets, and dictionaries. And that's a basic introduction to tuples in Python. With tuples, we can store data in an ordered and immutable way, which can be used in certain situations. So first, we'll start off with what is a dictionary? A dictionary is a collection of key value pairs that can be accessed using the keys as indices. They are equivalent to mappings in other programming languages. Dictionaries are denoted by curly braces, and each key value pair is separated by a colon. So there are a couple different ways you can declare dictionaries in Python. One of them is to use the dict keyword with open and close parentheses to create an empty dictionary. And for this, we have our person is equal to an empty dictionary. 
So another way to create a dictionary in Python is to use these open and close curly braces. And inside these curly braces, you will provide a key followed by a colon, and then a value, and then comma separate between more than one key value pair. And you can see here that we can provide a key with any kind of value. So we have the name, which goes to a string. We have age, which goes to an integer. We can also specify numbers as keys and even Booleans as keys and values too. So now that we have a dictionary, let me show you what you can do with it. Well, first off, we can index a dictionary. So first up to access a value in a dictionary, we can use a key as an index. For example, if we want to get the name of this person dictionary, we can print the person with an open and close bracket and then provide the key that we want to get the value for it. So in this case, we're passing name, so this will return out John. So if we go ahead and run this file, you can see that it does print out John. And if the key doesn't exist and you try to access it, then it will throw an error. So in this case, if we try to access the occupation key, you can see that it's not in our dictionary up here. So if we go ahead and run this, it throws a key error for occupation since that does not exist in our dictionary. We can get around this by calling the dot get method on top of the dictionary. This will try to get the key, and if for some reason it can't get it, it will return a none value. That way it doesn't throw an error. So if we go ahead and run this, it does return none. And you can provide a second argument to return instead of none if the key doesn't exist. So for example, if we do comma and then a no occupation string, we'll go ahead and run this. And instead of none, it does print out no occupation. We can also add new key value pairs to the dictionary. So for example, let's say we want to add the key occupation. So we'll go ahead and set that equal to software engineer. This will go ahead and set this new key to this new value and include it whenever we try to access it. So now if we go ahead and print the person of the key occupation, we can see that it does print software engineer since we included that in there. So one thing to note is dictionaries are immutable, so we can update their values. Let's go ahead and throw an example. So let's say we want to update the value of this person's name to something else. So we can go ahead and say their name is equal to Bob now. And if we go ahead and print the person's name, we can see that it did print out Bob. Another thing we can do is we can clear the dictionary completely using the dot clear method. So here I have it to where it's printing out our person before we call clear, then we call the dot clear method, and then we print it again to see what the output is after. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that originally printing out first has all of our key values in it. After we clear it, it prints out an empty dictionary. We can also delete key value pairs from a dictionary using the del keyword. For example, let's say we want to delete the location of this person. We can say del of person location and it will delete it from our dictionary. So if we go ahead and run this. We can see that before we deleted it, it has a location keyword and after that it does not have it anymore. Alternatively to deleting, if we want to get the value at this and delete at the same time, we can call dot pop. So we can say our value is equal to person dot pop and we'll specify the key we want to pop. It will give us the value from there, so it'll return us New York. We'll go ahead and print our person to see the new updated dictionary and the value that we popped from it. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that the first time we print it, we have the location key value pair. The second time we do not, and we have the New York value returned to us. If we want to see how many key value pairs our dictionary has, we can use the length keyword on top of our dictionary. So here we're printing out the length of our person. And whenever we go ahead and run it, it does print out three since there are three key value pairs. If we ever just want to see what keys are in our dictionary, we can use the dot keys open and close parentheses function. This will return just a list of keys from this dictionary. So whenever we go ahead and run it, we can see that we have the dict keys of a name, age, and location. We can also do the same thing just to get the values from our dictionary by calling the dot values method. And if we go ahead and run this, you can see it prints the dict values of John 30 and New York as what we have up here. If we want to get each key value pair individually, we can call the dot items method. Whenever we go ahead and run this, it does return a dict items of a list of tuples of key value, key value, key value. This is very useful for looping, and we'll get to that in a later video.
All right, and that's a basic introduction to dictionaries in Python. With dictionaries, we can store and manipulate data in a way that's both powerful and easy to use. So conditionals in Python are signified by if, elif, and else. And whenever you want code to be inside of a conditional statement like if, elif, and else, you need to indent the code inside of it. Let me show you what I mean. I'll start off with a variable x and we'll set it equal to 5. And we will say if x is greater than 3 and we follow it by a colon. Then on the next line, you want to provide a tab or four spaces. And then whatever is inside this indented block will be run only if this condition is met. So in this case, we are printing x is greater than 3. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out x is greater than 3. If we change this to less than, and we go ahead and run this, it doesn't print out anything because the condition was not met. And so to handle this case for a condition, we can provide an else followed by a colon. And we also go to the next line providing a tab. And we can go ahead and print out else block just to see that we hit this block. So if we go ahead and run this again, we can see that it does print out else block. So it didn't meet this condition and now it just falls down into here. And so now we can get into elif, which is else if. And in elif, we can provide another condition whereas else we cannot provide another condition. So here we can say elif x is greater than or equal to three. And here we can go ahead and print x is greater than or equal to three. So if we go ahead and run this, it does print out x is greater than or equal to three. Cool, and we can actually do what's called nesting if statements together. So nesting is just providing another if statement inside our if block. If x is equal to 5, then we can print out here x is 5. So if we go ahead and run this, it prints out x is 5 and x is greater than or equal to 3. Since it completed this block and it's still within this elif x is greater than or equal to 3, it still runs whatever's left in here. So if statements aren't only limited to just variables being less than, equal to, or greater than, equal to, or equal to these values, if we want the opposite condition, we can use the not keyword. And whenever we run this, it does print out true since we're saying x is not less than 3. And since x is 5, that is true case. We can also say if true, which just means that this block will always run. And if we say if false, it will not run. We can say if not false, it will still run. And if not true, which is false, it will not run. So if statements work off of truthy falsy values, here are some falsy values inside Python, like empty lists, empty tuples, empty dictionaries, empty sets, strings with nothing in them, an empty range, zeros of any kind, and the none keyword. Any of these will provide a false value and will not run an if statement. But if you provide this not in front of these, they will make them run. So if we say not an empty list, it will go ahead and run. And for these, the truthy values of these are gonna be lists that have values in them. So any of these data structures that have stuff inside of them will consider true. A range of anything greater than zero will be true. Any integer or negative integer float imaginary number that's not zero will return a true value. So here's another example of using the conditionals with lists. So here we have x is equal to a list of 1, 2, 3. And then here we're saying if the length of our list is greater than 0, we will go ahead and print true. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see it does print out true. Since the list has three elements in it, it is greater than 0. But if we go ahead and change this condition to say if the length of our list is greater than 10, meaning that it has more than 10 elements inside of it, then it will print this true block. So we'll go ahead and run this, and it doesn't print out anything because there's only three elements inside of our list. Another example, which is a little bit different than others, is using the none keyword. So here we're saying if none, then we'll go ahead and print true, but in this case, none is a falsy value, so it's not gonna run this block at all. So if we go ahead and try and run it, it doesn't print out anything. We can say if not x, which is if not none, we go ahead and run this and it does print out true. Now there's also the case where you could say x is equal to none, 
if you want to make that comparison. VS Code doesn't really like that for me uh, because it's not best practice to do this, but this will work in most cases. And you can see that none is indeed equal to none. But the better way to check if something is none is to use the is keyword. So whenever we go and run this, it does print out true again. This is best practice and better to do this. And supposedly this is a lot faster too than doing the double equals. So another example that we have here is we're checking if an element is inside of our list using the in keyword. This also does work with tuples, sets, and dictionaries. But if we go ahead and say if two is in our list of x, we'll go ahead and run this and it does print out true since it is in there. And if we change this to something like 12, we'll go ahead and run it again and it doesn't print out anything. So here we have our x is equal to a dictionary of key value pairs of key to value and one to two. And here we're saying if key is in x dot values, which is the string key that we have in our keys right here. If it's in values, it will print out true. If not, it won't do anything. So when we go ahead and run this, it doesn't print out anything. That's because this key string is not in the values, which is just value and two. But if we change this to keys, we'll go ahead and run this and it does print out true. All right, and that's a basic introduction to conditional statements. Conditional statements are very useful in programming. While loops are blocks of code that will execute as long as a condition is true. So in order to start with a while loop, you need to use the while keyword. And then after that, you provide a condition. As long as the condition is true, the while loop will run. So we provide the condition of true here, and we provide a colon after our condition. This will indicate the start of the while block. And then we go ahead and indent, and everything that is indented within this block will run. So if we go ahead and just run this code that we have right here, we can see that it's just printing out high and it's not stopping. That is because what we have our condition to while true, which means it'll keep running forever and ever. So go ahead and control C this. So we can go ahead and modify our while loop to have a condition of while our count is less than 10 and we have count up here equaling to zero and we are incrementing it by one each time we go through the while loop. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it stops printing high after 10 iterations. This is controlling our condition to the while loop and choosing when to exit the while loop. So there are a couple neat features in Python when it comes to looping. One of them is break statements. This will allow you to exit a loop early based on whatever conditions you want or whenever you call the break keyword. So in this case, we've modified the code to add an if statement of if our count is equal to five, we will go ahead and print we broke from the loop and we'll break out of this loop. If we go ahead and run this, we will see that it prints five times, which is the five iterations, and then it says broke from the loop and it stopped before it reached 10. So another neat thing about loops in Python is we can use the continue keyword. This will skip the rest of the current loop and go to the next iteration. So in this case, we've rearranged our code a little bit to say count plus equals one in the beginning. Then we have if our count is equal to five, we would go ahead and print that we continued from the loop and then use the continue keyword. And after that, we will print the count of whatever our current count is. So if we go ahead and run this, go ahead and pull up our terminal, we can see it goes one, two, three, four, there is no five, and it goes six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is because whenever we did hit this count equals five, we continued skipping the rest of this loop and going on to the next iteration. The next interesting thing you can do with while loops is you can nest them inside of each other. So an example here is we have a variable x equal to zero, and we're saying while x is less than three, so it'll loop three times. And we're gonna say y is equal to one, and while y is less than three, so it'll loop two times, we will print x and y and they will both increment after the end of each iteration. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see it prints 0, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2. So after each time this loop ends, it resets to y equals one, as we can see when it doesn't go over two, since it is less than three. 
So we can use what we saw earlier in the video about adding a break statement into our while loop. We go and put this in the second one and break will only break out of the current loop. So in this case, it only breaks out of this current while loop. It does not break out of the while loop above that. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see it prints out 0, 1, 1, 1, and 2, 1. Since our condition is if y equals 1, which is the first iteration of this inner while loop, it goes ahead and breaks this and never gets to 2. Another interesting thing about while loops is they actually have a secret else clause attached to them. And this else clause is only run if there is no breaks within the while loop and it does not stop for any reason. So for example, this x is equal to 0. Once this condition is no longer met and there is no breaks in between, it will go ahead and run whatever is in this else block. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does complete successfully. Or well, we're going to go ahead and add this if x is equal to 1 and we'll go ahead and break. Whenever we go ahead and run this, it does not print out anything since the loop did not complete all the way to the end. All right, and we do have a little bonus code here. We have our x is equal to 1 and we're counting is equal to 0. We will go ahead and say as long as our count is less than 10, we're going to increment our x by 1. So whenever our x modulus 2 is equal to 0, which means if 2 goes into that number evenly without a remainder, then we will go ahead and execute this if statement here, which we will go ahead and print the number and increase the count. This will find the first 10 even numbers starting from 1. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out the first 10 even numbers. So first up, what is a for loop? Well, a for loop is one of the most frequently used control flow statements in Python. It allows you to execute a set of statements repeatedly based on a sequence of elements. The sequence can be a list, tuple, string, or any other iterable object. So let's dive in and explore the world of for loops in Python. First up, we'll start with the syntax of for loops. For loops are denoted by the keyword for, some variable name inside a collection. The variable represents the current element of the sequence, and the sequence is a collection of elements that we want to iterate over. And then anything that is inside this for loop will be indented below it. The statements inside of the loop are executed repeatedly for each element in the sequence. Let's see an example of how for loops work. Suppose we have a list of numbers from 1 to 5, and we want to print each number in a separate line. We can use a for loop to achieve this goal. So here we have a list of numbers from 1 to 5 stored in a numbers variable. And we're saying for num in numbers, we are printing out the number that we're currently on. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out 1 through 5. Awesome. Python provides the range function, which generates a sequence of numbers between a range. We can use this function in conjunction with a for loop to iterate over a range of numbers. So here's an example. We're saying for i in range 1, 6, the first number is included in the sequence that is generated, and the second number is excluded from the sequence generated. So it stops at the number before it. So this will return a range of numbers from 1 to 5. If we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out 1 through 5. For loops aren't limited by one level of looping. We can actually nest them together, similar to how we did for while loops. So here in this example, we have for one in range of three. This is giving us a range of numbers between zero and three, which ultimately just gives us a list of zero to two. And then we say for two in range of four, and then we're printing out one and two. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it prints out all of the numbers together like this. We can see that the number one variable is printing zero four times, one four times, and two four times. Through each iteration of this outer loop, it's completing everything in the next loop. So it runs through this four times since that is our range, and it's printing out 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and so on for the rest of them. We can also use for loops to iterate over a string. And so here's an example. We have a string hello world set into the my string variable. And we're saying for character in my string, we will print the character. So whenever we go ahead and run this, it prints out each character individually, 
because it treats this as a collection or a list of characters. There is also an optional else block that you can supply for a for loop. The code in the else block will execute if the for loop completes normally without encountering a break statement. So here's an example. We're looping over a range of numbers from 2 to 10, and we're saying if our number is equal to 5, we will break out of this for loop. And we have supplied an else clause that if this loop completes normally without breaking, we will print out didn't have a break. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it doesn't print out anything since it did break out of the loop when n was equal to 5. But if we change this to some other number that's not a part of this range, and we go ahead and run this, we can see it didn't have a break, so it completed normally. So in addition to iterating over a string, a list, or a range, we'll also see some other kind of data sets that we can loop over in a for loop. So here we have a set of numbers and strings, and we're saying for item in our set, we will print the item. If we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out each item in the set. We can also see the exact same thing for tuples, where this tuple is a tuple of numbers and strings. We go ahead and say for item in our tuple, and we go ahead and run this, and it does print out each item in this tuple. So dictionaries are quite interesting when it comes to for loops. First off, we'll start with iterating over the keys in a dictionary. So here we have a dictionary that has some keys to some values. And we're saying for the key in our dictionary dot keys to get a list of the keys, we will print out the string key and then have the actual key next to it. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it prints out the key A, B, C, since these are our keys right here, A, B, and C. And just like iterating over the keys, we can iterate over the values in a dictionary as well. So here we're saying for value in our dictionary dot values to get a list of the values, and we're printing out the string value with the actual value next to it. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see it prints out the values of one, banana, and a list of 0, 1, 2, since those are our values right here. And going into the next one is if you want to get each key value pair individually, we can loop over dictionary.items to get a list of key value pairs. So we're saying for item in our dictionary.items, we'll go ahead and print out the string item with the item next to it. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we do get item with a tuple of key value pairs. So whenever you're looping over a collection in Python and the actual value that you're getting, so in this case, item is a tuple of more than one item, that you can actually use multiple arguments to get those items individually. So here, since it is a tuple, we can say item of zero to get the first element and then item of one to get the second element. And whenever we go ahead and run this, we see that it does print out A, one, B, banana, C, and the list. And that's fine and all, but that can get confusing when you're working with larger files. So another way to do this is instead of this item here, you can type key value or whatever variable names you wanna use. And we replace this item of zero with key, an item of one with value. And whenever we go ahead and run this, it does the exact same output. This makes your code a little bit more readable for anyone looking at your code iterating over dictionary items. And I do use this a lot in my professional career. So first up, let's find out what are functions in Python. They are reusable blocks of code that you can call whenever you need to to perform a specific task. So imagine you're baking a cake and you need to follow a recipe in order to make the cake. Functions work in a very similar way. Functions have a name, parameters, which are inputs, and a return value, which is an output. They allow us to write cleaner and more organized code. To define a function in Python, we use the def keyword followed by the function name, parentheses, and a colon. Whatever we want to include in our function will be all the lines indented below our function name. So here's an example. We use the def keyword followed by our function name, which is greet in this case, with open close parentheses and a colon, and then we indent to print out hello world. We can then call this function just by saying its name by open and close parentheses. So we can go ahead and run this, and we can see that the output is hello world. So if we go ahead and call this function a few more times, and we go ahead and run this, we can see it's printing out hello world as many times as we called it. So cool, that was easy to set up. 
You will hear the terms arguments and parameters used interchangeably, but there actually is a difference between them. Parameters are variables listed in the function definition, whereas arguments are what we pass into the function when we actually call the function. And so function arguments allow us to customize the behavior of a function. And so here we've modified our function declaration by adding a parameter name here, and then we are using that inside of our print statement. And we've now added an argument into our greet functions down here when we call them. So the first one is Zectech and the second one is Bob. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see it saying hello Zectech and hello Bob. Whenever you call a function that has more than one parameter, you provide arguments that match the parameters order. So in this case, we have the parameters name and extra words, and we're using them in both of our print statements inside the function. So whenever we call this Greek command, we have the first argument as Zectech and the second one as cool. So whenever we go ahead and run this, it prints out hello Zectech and you are cool. And just to show you that order does matter, we'll go ahead and provide this greet function with the arguments in the flipped order. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that the first one ran with hello Zectech and you are cool. The second one ran with hello cool, you are Zectech. Functions can also return values using the return keyword. This lets you use functions result inside of your code. If you don't use a return keyword, the functions in Python default to returning a none value. So we'll go ahead and test this here by having an add function taking in two parameters of a and b and adding them together inside of the function. And we aren't returning anything. So whenever we go ahead and assign this sum result equals to add, it should give us a none value and we'll go ahead and print it. So whenever we go ahead and run this, it does give us none. But if we go ahead and add this return result right here and we run it again, it gives us eight as we are adding five and three. Sometimes functions will have default values for their parameters, and you can override these default values if you need to. So going back to the greet function that we had, we had our variable name, but now we're assigning it to a default value of guest. And so if we don't pass any arguments into this function, it will use this default value here whenever it prints out this statement. So here we're calling greet with no arguments being passed in, then we're calling greet again below it passing in arguments. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see it prints hello guest, hello Zectech and banana. And we can see since we didn't provide any arguments, it used the default value of guest here. And whenever there is a parameter with a default value in here, we can specify that inside the function whenever we're calling it. So we can say name equals Zectech and name equals banana. And whenever we go ahead and run this, it does the exact same output. Whenever you have parameters that need to be passed in or name parameters, in this case, default parameters, the default parameters need to come after all of the parameters that need to be passed in. If we came over here and set a parameter of two, you can see that I'm getting an error here by PyLance because it does not like that and it does not work like that. Um, but these functions will not work having these name parameters or default parameters in between like this or even first. They always have to go at the end of your function declaration. And so this also is the same for whenever you're passing in arguments. So as our first parameter is greeting and our second one is a default parameter of guest, whenever we call this greet function, we can pass in hello as our greeting and we don't need to pass in a name. For the second function call right here, we're passing in hello as our argument for the greeting parameter. And then the second argument is setting the name parameter inside this function. And this is all fine. But the third time we're calling this greet function, our first argument is the name parameter, and we're setting that before our required parameter of greeting. So this hello argument does not work in this situation. If we were to try to run this, we can see that positional arguments follow keyword argument. So sometimes you'll see a strange syntax of star args or star star kwargs in a function. These allow us to catch the extra arguments passed that we don't have parameters for. So in this case, we have our function greet, and our first parameter is name, and then we have a star args catching all other parameters after that. So we're printing hello the person, the type of our arguments, and we'll go ahead and print them out as well. And so we call the greet function with Zectech as our first argument, and then we're passing in one, two, three, four as the next arguments. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it's printing hello Zectech, and the type of our arguments that's catching all of the other arguments is actually a tuple. And so whenever we print it, it prints it as a tuple. 
And so we can access the values of this tuple just like we could with regular tuples. So if we run this again, it's printing out two since that is in the second position, which is number one inside these brackets. Here's an example with star star keywords, and this will capture any extra arguments that you name while passing in. So in this case, we have our greet function and our first argument is ectech, and then we have named arguments of values equals the list of one, two, three, four, and banana equals true. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it actually captures these named parameters into a dictionary of values one, two, three, four, and banana of true. And we can see that it is printing out right here, the dictionary as the type. And then you can access these values just like a regular dictionary. And so we can also use both of them together like this. We have our greet function with the name parameter, then star args and star star kwargs. And the KW does stand for keyword arguments. But here we're printing out hello and the name, and then printing our args and our keyword arguments. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see it's printing hello Zectech, our keyword arguments of one, two, since those are right here, and our values of one, two, three, four as a list, since that is the named argument right here. Sometimes when you're writing code or you're looking through other people's code, you'll see that in their function, they have the pass keyword or an ellipses of three dots. These essentially do the same thing where there's no implementation details, meaning we don't have any code in here that needs to run just yet and we'll implement it later. But just to show them no errors, we go ahead and do this. That way we have our function declared. And we can even call functions inside other functions. So here we have a function hi that just prints hi. And then we have our function greet that takes in a name parameter and says hello to that person. And we call the hi function. So if we call greet Zectech, we'll go ahead and run it, prints hello Zectech, and it says hi since it called that function. If we need a function that's only going to be called inside one of our other functions and we don't really need it anywhere else in the code, we can put it inside our function by indenting it and declaring it like we did before. So in this case, we have the hi function and it does print hi again, and we still print our greeting and then we call the hi function. So if we run this, we can see it has the exact same output. And we can see here, if we try calling this hi function outside of the greet function, it does not work saying it is not defined because this function only exists within this other function. Now you know how to define functions, pass parameters and get results back. The most straightforward way to get input from a user in Python is by using the input function. Let me show you how it works. So here we'll have a variable called name and we'll set it equal to the input. And inside this input function, we can provide a string of whatever we want to present to our users. So a question we want them to answer. So in this case, we're asking, what's your name? And then we'll go ahead and run this. And we can see that in the console, it's asking, what is your name? And allows us to type. Let's go ahead and type Zectech, and we'll press enter, and then the program's done. So now we know how to capture input. Let's do something with it. We'll go ahead and add this print statement here, and we'll go ahead and print hello to our user. So we'll go ahead and run this again, asking what's your name. We say Zectech, and it says hello Zectech. Awesome. So now that you know how to take user input, let's see what we can do with it. So here we've changed our input variable to num1 equal to float open parenthesis of our input with our question enter the first number and then close parentheses for both this will take whatever the input is from the user and convert it into a float since whatever the input we get from the user is a string we need to convert it into a float so we can do some kind of mathematics on it all right we'll go ahead and make another variable called num2 it's the exact same thing but we're saying enter the second number and then we'll go ahead and say our result is equal to num1 plus num2. And we'll go ahead and print out the sum is and the result of whatever they put in. So we'll go ahead and run this. And we'll enter 2 is our first number and 4 is our second number. And it says the sum is 6. Awesome. So what I just showed you is one way of how we can accept multiple pieces of information from the user. But we can also do it with just one input and splitting it at whatever value we want to. Here's an example. We have a variable called full name and we're getting the input from the user to enter their full name. And then we say full name is equal to full name dot split. This will split the string into an array based on what we decide to split on. 
the default is any spaces inside of the string. But you can specify here like a dash if you wanted to split on a dash. But for the purpose of this video, we're just going to have split with nothing in it. And since we're splitting it by entering their first and last name only, it turns it into this array right here of first and last name. And then we get the corresponding values. So first name is the first index of the array and last name is the second index of the array. And then we'll go ahead and print it with an F string having an F before our quotation marks and inside our quotation marks having the curly braces around our variable names in order to print them correctly. So we'll go ahead and run this. And we'll say our full name is Zectech. And you can see it says, hello, Zectech, as it got my first and last name here. We can also use while loops or even for loops to continuously get input from a user. So we can do this forever or until a specific condition is met. So for example, we have while true here and we're saying number is equal to input of enter a number. And we'll go ahead and run this and it's asking for a number. So we'll go ahead and put three, four, five, six, and it's not stopping. It just keeps going. We can exit this by pressing Control C or Command C on a Mac to keyboard interrupt and stop the program. In this case, we can say instead of enter a number, we'll say guess a number. And we'll have the user continuously enter a number in until they get the right number. So here we can add some logic like if num is equal to, let's say two, then we will break out of this loop. We will also add a print statement for you guess the number. And then we'll also say else as if the person didn't get it right, we will print out wrong number, guess again. And then we do need to cast this as an integer. So we'll wrap this input in parentheses and add int in the front. So this way we can do this check correctly. So we'll go ahead and run this. And we enter a number, let's say three, wrong number, guess again. Okay, I'll try again. Got 67, wasn't right. But if we happen to guess the lucky number of two, you guess the number and the program ended. Super cool. And that's pretty much it for getting user input in Python. You can see that it's pretty straightforward and it's really easy to get input from the user. So first off, we'll start with what is a class? Well, a class is like a blueprint for creating objects. It defines a set of attributes and methods that the objects created from it will have. We create classes using the class keyword followed by the name and a colon. Everything that will be included in the class will be indented below it. Functions defined in a class are called methods. Let's take a look at an example. So here we have the class dog followed by a colon. And then we have these two methods here. One of them is a double underscore init double underscore. These are also known as dunder methods or magic methods. They are special methods that determine the object's behavior in certain situations. So in this case, this double underscore init is for initialization. If you come from other programming languages, this is very similar to a constructor. And you can see here that we have this first parameter of self. This is referring to the current class. So once we create a dog object, this is automatically passed in here and we don't have to worry about this. And so this self parameter is required for instance methods, which are the ones that we have created here. There are a couple other like static and class methods that we'll cover later in the video. And so since this self is referring to the current object, whenever we call something like self.name, self.breed, it sets a class variable that we can then reference in other methods. So in this case, you can see self.name equals name. So this is the name that we are providing whenever we create this object. And we are referencing down here in this other method called bark, where we have self.name. So there's a little bit of a hidden functionality behind this. Essentially, what this is doing is creating this name variable within this dog class that we can reference in any of these methods. But the way that classes work in Python, we don't need to have this name variable up here equal to something. And so now that we have the class, we can create objects or instances from it. Let's see an example of how to do that. So first, we'll create an object of our dog class. And we'll do that by saying dog is equal to our class dog. And we'll have open and closed parentheses passing in these name and breed parameters. So in this case, we have Leo and Corgi, and this has successfully instantiated or created our dog object, and we have it into a variable. And since we have that now, we can access the attributes of the class. So in this case, we can access the name and the breed since we have the self dot in front of it. So we'll go ahead and print our dog.name and dog.breed, and we can go ahead and run this. 
and you can see in our console it does print out Leo and Corgi. And now that we have that, we can call the method inside of the class. So in this case, we're calling the bark method inside of the dog class. So we do dog.bark. And if we go ahead and run this, we can see it still prints our Leo and Corgi. And we print out that Leo barks, which is the dog name, barks up here in the bark method. And you can see in our init function, we have an age variable we're setting equal to three. Because we are not declaring this as self.age, we cannot access this variable outside of this method. So if we were to come down to this bark method and print self.age, the syntax highlighting is not turning this blue, meaning that it can't find this. But if we were to try to run this, it would end up throwing an error. And you can see here that we do instantiate this dog, we create this dog object, and we try to make it bark. Even though we've set this age variable in this method, it cannot be accessed from other methods within this class since we did not start it with a self.age. So in Python, every class implicitly inherits from an object class, which is the root of the class hierarchy. This is because Python follows the object-oriented programming paradigm, where everything is an object, and all objects have properties and methods that define the object's behavior. Here you can see three different ways that we create a class one with just the class name, the second one with parentheses with nothing in it, and the third one with parentheses with object in it. In Python 3, these all do the exact same thing. In Python 2, stating that a class inherits from object was different than just declaring a class without inheriting from object. But in Python 3, these are all the same and it doesn't matter. So you can choose how to declare a class the way that you prefer. Whenever you have a class that is inheriting from another class, the class that you're inheriting from becomes the super class, and the class that inherited from the super class becomes the subclass. So here we do still have our dog class that we had earlier, but we also created another class called service dog, which is another type of dog. It inherits from our original dog object, meaning that we can still access all of the functions and variables that are inside this original dog object. And then we include any extra functionality that we want to add to this specific class. So in this case, the service dog can still bark from the dog class, and it can also do something else like adding the serve method. And you can see inside this dunder init, we are initializing it with a name, breed, and a service. And we're calling super with open and close parentheses. This is giving us the actual dog object. And the super just refers to the class above this. And so we're calling the dunder init from the super class. So it's referring to this dunder init up here in the original dog class. And it's passing it in the name and the breed to go ahead and set those variables. And then we're also setting a variable called self.service. That way we can access it somewhere else inside of this class. So then we have the serve method here where we're printing out the name of the dog and they are serving as a specific service. And now that we have the service dog class all set up, we'll go ahead and instantiate a new service dog. So to do that, we'll say our variable Leo is equal to service dog and we pass in the name, the breed, and what kind of service they do. So in this case, they are a guide dog. And then we will call the method serve from our Leo object. And then we'll go ahead and print out this right here. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see Leo is serving as a guide dog. And then we'll go ahead and call the bark method that way to show you that we can call methods from the objects that we inherited from. So if we go ahead and run this again, we can see it's still showing Leo is serving as a guide dog and it says that Leo barks. And the kind of methods that we saw earlier are instance methods. That requires a class to be initialized with parentheses. There are also a few other types of methods we can create for our class. There are class methods and static methods. Class methods are usually used to access class variables. You can call these methods directly using the class name instead of creating an object of that class. To declare a class method, we need to use the at class method decorator. And in part of this class method, we don't use the self keyword. We use the CLS variable to refer to the class. And here you can see we have a class called my class with a method called instance method with the self variable passed in. And then we're printing out this is an instance method. So if we were to go ahead and run this, we can see that it does print out this is an instance method. So now declaring a class method, we put this at class method decorator on it, 
and we create our method called class method. You can name these whatever you want. I'm just doing this for demonstration of the video. Uh, but we are passing in CLS instead of self and then printing out this is a class method. And so the way that we can access this method is just by calling the my class name without instantiating it and then doing dot class method. If we were to go ahead and run this, you can see it is printing out both the instance method and the class method. Uh, with the class method, we can still access class variables. And then we have the at static method decorator creating a static method. And then we print out this is a static method. This one doesn't have CLS or self passed into it, so we have no reference to anything inside of this class. Static methods are usually used as a utility function or when we do not want an inherited class to modify a function definition. These methods do not have any relation to the class variables and instance variables. So they are not allowed to modify the class attributes inside of the static method. And so to call the static method is the exact same way as we call a class method. So we have my class dot static method. Then we go ahead and run this. And you can see it is printing it out too. Note that even if you instantiate the class for all of these, they will all still work. Classes can also implement other special methods like this double underscore in it. So I'll show you an example with double underscore add. This will allow us to add two classes together. So it passes in the self reference to the current object and the other to the other object. And so in here we are returning my string class of the self.string plus the other string combining the strings together. And so in this case, we're having an S1 variable set equal to my string of hello and an S2 variable set to my string of world. And in this case, we're gonna go ahead and add these two together. Whenever we do, it does return the object here. So we'll go ahead and say S3 is equal to adding these two together. And we will say S3 dot string. Whenever we go ahead and run this again, it prints out hello world. And so instead of us needing to do this, we can add a double underscore str. This double underscore str double underscore will allow us to define the way we want to print this object. So in this case, we're just returning self.string. And so down here in this s3, we actually don't need to do dot string anymore. We can just do print s3. And if we go ahead and run it, it does print out hello world. And there are many more magic methods out there that could be useful for your situation. You can look into them and see if they meet whatever you need to solve. So in Python, we can create multiple classes with the same name. But what happens if we try to access a function in the class? In this case, we're declaring class my class three times. But the print statement is different in each one. The first one prints A, then B, and then C. Here we're having a my class variable and setting it equal to my class and instantiating it. And then we're going to go ahead and print this out. What do you think is going to print? Let's find out. If we go ahead and run this, we can see that it's actually printing C. This is because in Python, classes are immutable objects, and defining a class with the same name more than once will effectively overwrite the previous definition. This means that the most recent definition, so closer to the bottom of the file, will be the one that's actually used. To avoid confusion, it's usually best to avoid redefining classes like this in your code. And so that's a basic introduction to classes in Python. There's a lot more to explore, like different techniques and design patterns for creating and using classes, but I hope this gives you a good starting point. We'll look at how to gracefully handle errors and exceptions to make your programs more robust and user friendly. So let's get started. So first up, we'll start with what is error handling? Error handling is a mechanism that allows you to catch and deal with errors and exceptions that occur during the execution of a program. This can help you avoid crashes and provide useful feedback. The basic building blocks of error handling in Python are the try and accept blocks. Anything that is indented below the try or accept are going to be part of those blocks. And if an error happens inside of the try block, it will then get cached by any sort of exception handling down below it. Here in this example, we tried dividing by zero, which would normally crash the program. However, the try block allows us to catch the error and print a user-friendly message instead. So if we go ahead and run this, you can see it says you can't divide by zero. And if we were to take this try except away and run the program, it would throw an error. And here we are using a very general exception that will catch any error exception that happens within the try block above. It's generally not a good practice to use just exception to catch all errors, but for this tutorial, I'm just informing you about it. Another thing to note is we don't have to include a specific exception to catch. So if we were to get rid of this exception variable right here, this is essentially doing the exact same thing by catching a very general exception. But if we want to be able to do something with this exception, we will need to include the exception that you're catching here. 
and we'll see later on how we can actually do something with the exception. So we'll go ahead and modify this to be a more specific error handle. So in this case, you can see from our last output that we had a zero division error. And so that's the only thing that's happening inside this try block is dividing by zero or the possibility of dividing by zero. So that's the specific error that we're going to catch. So if we go ahead and run this, it does catch it. It doesn't throw another zero division error into the console. We can also get the error message from the exception that happened. We do this by adding as and then whatever we want a variable to be called. So in this case, I'm calling it exception. And then we can go ahead and print this exception. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we have the you can't divide by zero. And the specific error message that's coming back is the division by zero message. This can be very useful when you have a very large code base and you want to know specifically what happened to cause the error. We can also catch multiple exceptions using multiple except blocks. So in this case, we have x is equal to int of our string string, and we still have our exception of a zero division error. But if we go ahead and run this, it ends up throwing another error, but this time it's a value error because it cannot convert this string to an integer. We can add this second except block with a value error to catch for this specific case. So whenever we go ahead and run this again, you can see it doesn't throw that value error in the console and just has whatever we printed inside of this value error except block. And you can stack as many exceptions as you need. We can also use the else block for more control. A lot of programmers don't know that you can use an else block in a try except case, although sometimes it's not really necessary. So in this case, we have a variable result is equal to 10 divided by five. And if there are no errors, then this else block will go ahead and run. So whenever we go and run this, we can see that division was successful down in the console. The try except also has a finally block that will run no matter whether there was an exception or not. So here we added the finally keyword and we added the print, this will always run. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see division was successful and this will always run. If we change this five into a zero to raise the zero division error, it will go ahead and say, you can't divide by zero, meaning we got that error, but it still says this will always run, meaning it got to that finally block. And so in Python, you can raise exceptions to indicate that something exceptional or unexpected has happened that cannot be dealt by the normal program flow. Exceptions are raised when an error or other exception condition occurs in your program. Once raised, an exception will propagate up the call stack until it's caught by an exception handler. If not caught, the program will terminate. We can raise an exception using the raise keyword in Python. And then we can call the exception that we want to raise. So in this case, a zero division error. And then we can actually specify a specific message that could be inside this exception that we're handling. So in this case, I'm adding the message wrong division. And then we're accepting the zero division error as exception and printing that out. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it prints out wrong division. We can also create our own custom exception classes by inheriting from the exception class or any of its subclasses. So for example, we have a class custom error here inheriting from exception. And we're not having anything inside of it, so we're just passing. And then inside our try block, we're raising this custom error with our custom message of this is a custom error. And then we're catching that custom error as exception and printing it out. So whenever we go and run this, we can see this is a custom error. We can also catch and rethrow exceptions using the raise keyword without any arguments in an accept block. So here we add the keyword raise in our accept block. And whenever we go and run this, it does throw the custom error into our console and cause our program to stop running. And let's say we wanted to inherit this from a value error. We can go ahead and do that just by replacing exception with a value error. And Python does have several built-in exceptions like type error, index error, key error, and many more. You can look them up to see if there's a specific error you want to try catching. And well, that's all you really need to know for basic error handling. And so a Python module is basically a Python script that you can call within another Python script. It allows you to logically organize your Python code, making it easier to understand and use. So let's get started on creating a module. So here I've created a file called module.py. And in here we add two functions. One is called greeting that takes in a name and it returns an F string saying hello to whoever's name we passed into this function. And then we have another function called add, which is simply just adding two numbers together. And so since this isn't a file, we want to be able to access it from a different file. So we can come over here and create a new file and we'll just call it app.py. And in order to access functions from another file or even classes or variables, you just have to say from your file name. So module 
and we will import whatever it is we want to import. If we want to just import everything, we can do a star. When you're working with very large files that have a lot of different things that you can import, it's generally not a good idea to do it like this. It's good practice just to import whatever you need from a file. So in this case, we want to bring in that greeting function that we had in the file, and we'll say a comma because we want to bring in something else. We'll, in, we'll add in that add function here too. And so now that we've imported it, we can use it within this file. So we'll go ahead and say print, and we'll have a greeting, and we'll say Zek, and then we will go ahead and run this, and we can see it says, hello Zek. Awesome. Let's do the same thing for the add function now. So we'll go ahead and say print, and we'll add, let's say 27 and 37. And so now we'll go ahead and run this again, and we have 64, and it's that easy. And so once you start looking around some different code bases, you'll notice that there is a very special file in a folder called a double underscore init double underscore dot py. Having this file in there turns an entire folder into a module. That way you don't have to dive deep into the folder in order to find the specific function that you need. You can just do something like this where it's from the folder name, import whatever it is you need. And I'll go ahead and show you what I'm talking about. So over here, we're going to create a folder called my module. And we're going to go ahead and move this module.py file into this my module folder. And so once we do this, we can see that my syntax highlighting has a little squiggly here, meaning that basically it can't find this module. That's because we've now put it inside this folder. So we could say my module dot to access a file or folder within that. So we can see over here, this my module and inside here we have the module file. That's what's happening right here to access these specific functions within this specific file. And so back to what I was talking about is you will generally see this double underscore init double underscore dot py in here. And so this is a very special file and we can import all of the functions or variables that we want into this specific file to then just be accessed by calling this my module folder. So just like in this app.py file, when originally we had from module import all these things, we'll basically go ahead and take this, add it like this. And since we've added this in here, we can go back to our app.py file and instead of from module, we can specify the folder name. So we can say from my module import greeting and add. And you can see my syntax highlighting is registering all of these. And if we go ahead and try and run this, we can see there is an error saying that the module is not found. And that is because when we're running this file here, it's not within this directory of my module. So this init file is saying from module and it's expecting it to be at the same level of where we're calling the file. So how we can get around this is by putting a period in front of this module. This is saying relative to this current file, which is the double underscore init double underscore, we're going to get this module, which it recognizes it in the same directory. And we will go ahead and import greeting and add, and this will solve the issue. So if we head back over to our app.py file and run this again, we can see that it does work. And so having this period is relative to this current file, but if you were to do something like add a second period, then this would go up a directory. So then we could import something from our app.py or any other file that we have over here. But for this case, we'll just leave it as it is like this, and then we're all good to go. So a Python library is a collection of modules and it allows you to perform many actions without having to write your own code. Python does have an extensive ecosystem of different libraries. There are quite a bit of built-in libraries within Python, and there's a lot of external libraries as well. One of the built-in ones is the OS library. We can use this library to interact with the operating system, like getting the current directory, operating system information, changing directory, listing the directory, and many more. And so for this example, we'll go ahead and import OS. So we can go ahead and access the library relating to the operating system. And as an example, we'll go ahead and say os.cpu count to find out how many CPUs this computer has. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it has 24. We can also get the current directory of the file by calling os.getcwd. And this will get the current working directory. So meaning if you run this file, but you call this function within a folder, it's still going to print the current working directory of the file that you ran from. So we can go ahead and run this and we can see the path that it brings us. So we can also change directory by calling os.chdir, so change directory, and we specify a folder path for it to change to. So in this case, I'm doing dot forward slash test, and I don't have this file here, so if I try running this, it will throw an error. But if we go over here and create this folder test, and we run this again, you can see that it didn't throw an error. 
So just to verify that we've made it inside this folder, we'll go ahead and print the current working directory again. And whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it has changed to this test folder. Another pretty useful one is os.listdir to list everything inside of the current directory. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it prints app.py, test, and this pycache, which is everything that is here. And this is just an example of one built-in library within Python. There are many more that you can find online, but we'll go ahead and get into some external libraries. And so in order to install these external libraries, you need something called pip. And so pip does stand for preferred installer program. It installs packages from the Python package index. You can access the website version of this going to pypi.org. So you can find out if you have pip already installed just by typing the command pip and we'll do dash dash version. And we can see it does give us a little output here. If you get an error saying that it's not found, then you need to install pip. And you can do that by typing python dash m ensure pip dash dash upgrade and press enter. And this will install pip for the command line for you. But once that's installed, you want to go ahead and open up a new terminal. So we'll go ahead and close this one and press control tilde to open a new one or command tilde on Mac. And then you should be able to type pip dash dash version and then have it pop up here. So one example that we get started with is NumPy. And NumPy is a Python library that's mostly written in C to be really fast for numerical operations. And so we can go ahead and come down to the command line and type pip install NumPy to go ahead and install this external package and press enter. Yep, and I already have this installed, but you will see it install for you. But once we have that installed, we can go and come up here and we'll import NumPy. And we can say as in P to give it a shorter or different name. This is very useful if you have conflicting modules. So modules that have the same name, or if you just don't want to end up typing out all of this. And so we can go ahead and create an array with NumPy. And it's a little bit different than making a list in Python. We'll say mp.array, open and close parentheses, and then basically make a list inside of it. So we'll have one, two, and three. And then we'll go ahead and print out the array. So we'll go ahead and run this and see that it basically just prints a list, but you can see there's no commas in between. This is just how NumPy is formatting this array to be printed out to the console. But we can go ahead and perform a numerical operation by saying array.max to find the max in this array. And whenever we run it, we can see that three is the max. And we can even rewrite this to be a two-dimensional array. So we have an array of a list of one, two, three, and a list of four, five, six. And we'll go ahead and print it and print out the max from this. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it found the max number inside this two-dimensional array, and it was six. Another very popular library is matplotlib, and we use it for data visualization. So creating graphs and other kinds of visualizations for data. And so we can install this by coming down to the console and typing pip install matplotlib and press enter. And if you don't have it already installed, then it will go ahead and install everything. And for this, we're going to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt because we don't want to type all that out. And here we're going to call plt.plot. We're going to plot some data having the x coordinates and the y coordinates. So once we do that, we can go ahead and say plt.show to go ahead and show us what it looks like. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it popped up a graph with the points on it. So that's really easy. So there you have it. Modules and libraries are crucial tools for any Python developer. Reading and writing the files is crucial for data storage, logging, and many other applications. So let's dive right in. And so the key function to working with files in Python is the open function. The open function takes two main arguments that we will focus on for now, and we will cover another one later in the video. And there are four different methods or modes for opening a file. We have R for read, which is the default value. It opens a file for reading and throws an error if the file does not exist. We have A to open the file in appending mode, which will create the file if it does not exist and allow us to write to the file adding on to it. We have W that is write. It opens the file for writing and it creates the file if it does not exist. And then we have X, which is for create, it creates the specified file and returns an error if the file already exists. It also allows us to write to the file. You can also specify if the file should be handled as binary or text mode. Providing a T will be for text mode and is the default value, so you don't need to include a T. And then we have B for binary, which can be used for something like images. 
So let's jump right into this. So we'll go ahead and start by having a variable f equals open and then the name of the file that we want to open. This will search for the file relative to the file that is running at the moment. So in this case, it's looking in the directory of files.py, which is right over here. And since the default modes are R for read and T for text, you can provide them here if you want to be explicit, but you don't need to include these. So we can go ahead and just leave these off. And if we do try to run this, we can see that it does throw an error because this file does not exist. We can come over here to the left side and just create this demo file.txt. And here we'll just say this is an example. Save it and go back over to files.py. And we'll go ahead and run this again. And we can see there was no error thrown. So cool, it recognized that the file existed. So once we do this, we can actually read from this file since we are in the read mode. We can do this by doing f.read. This will read all of the contents of the file into one string. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it got this is an example down here at the bottom, which is inside our demo file.txt. You can also optionally pass in an argument to specify the number of characters to read from the file. So in this case, if we say five and go ahead and run this again, we can see that it only got this and then a space after that since that is five characters. So if we don't know how long each line is and we just want to read one line at a time, we can use the read line function. So doing this, we can go ahead and run this and it gets that this is an example. If we come back over to our demo file.txt and we say apple and orange, just to show there's more than one line, we'll go ahead and run this again. And it is just printing one line at a time. And there is an extra space it's printing here because of the new line character. But if we go ahead and control C, control V this and run it again, we see that it is printing this as an example and apple. So it is going line by line in our demo file.txt. We can also use the read lines function to read all the lines in a file and return them into a list. So if we go ahead and run this, we can see that all the lines in the file are in a list of strings. And you can see the new line characters at the end of these two. We can also use the seek command to go to a specific spot within the file. So for this case, let's say we read two lines and then we want to go back to the beginning of the file. We can do that by saying f.seek. Uh, zero to go back to the first position of the file. And we'll go ahead and print read line again after this. And we'll go ahead and run this and we can see that it's saying this is an example, Apple, and it goes back to the beginning after we seek to zero that this is an example. And it's generally a good practice to close the file after you're done with it. Files are limited resources managed by the operating system. Making sure files are closed after use will protect against hard to debug issues like running out of file handles experiencing corrupt data. So we can do this by saying f.close. And to note that Python does automatically close the file when the variable for the file is reassigned to another file. So say for example, when we're having this f equals the first open of demo file and we reassign it to demo file 2, it will go ahead and close this first file. And you can see there are many different ways to read from a file, but it can be quite inconvenient to remember to close the file. Luckily, Python has something useful called context managers, and we can use this to automatically close files after we're done with them. So we can do this using the with keyword, then opening the file in whatever mode we want as a variable name. So in this case, we're just calling it file. And we can print out file.readlines. Here I've created a different demo.txt file with just this is another example, orange and banana. But back in our files.py file, if we go ahead and run this, we can see that it does just print out everything from the file. So under the hood, what this is actually doing is whenever we're calling this with open as file, it's initializing the file object using the open command. And then we're entering into this context, which is this block of code that we have indented as it returns this file object, which we're labeling it as file here, and we can access it. And then whenever it's done with this context and we get out of it, it performs this exit and it closes the file for us. There are a lot of cool things you can do with context managers, but we'll go into that in a later video. So we'll go into writing to files now. So instead of the R that you did see here or having nothing at all, we must provide the W keyword to indicate that we are opening a file to write to it. And so once we have this, we're doing file.write to write to the file. And we're saying hello world and then same thing for hello Zectech. If we go ahead and go over to a demo.txt file, we can see that it already has these contents in here. But whenever we go ahead and run this program, there is no output. 
But if we go back into our demo.txt file, we can see that it has been completely overwritten. And that's because the W treats the file as if it was a brand new nothing in it file. It overwrites anything that's inside. And we can also see that it wrote everything to one line, not two lines like we have it here in two different writes. That's because write doesn't automatically apply a new line character, and we have to add that specifically in order to see it in the file. So adding this backslash in is a new line character. And whenever we go ahead and run this and go back to the demo.txt file, we can see that it did apply that new line character. We can also write more than one thing using the write lines function. It does take any kind of iterable in as an input, whether it's a list, a tuple, a set, or any other kind of iterable. And so here we have contents one is equal to this list of this is a list with a new line character at the end. And we're opening the demo.txt file in write mode as file, and we're writing lines with all of the contents here. And so we'll go ahead and run this, no output, go back into our demo.txt file, and we see this is a list. And note there are no spaces in between as well. And so that is something you can come up here and add spaces if you want to. Another way to open this file is in a pen mode. And we'll do that by passing this A character here. And we can write to it and it just adds on to the file. So currently in the demo.txt file, we have this is a list. And if we go ahead and run this code, no output, we go to the demo.txt and it has appended text. So it is a nice way to add text to your files without completely overwriting everything in there, like with the opening in write mode. So another mode to open up is in X, which is create. As long as that file does not exist, it will create it. But if it does exist, then it will throw an error. So here we're opening demo2.txt in create mode. As long as this file doesn't exist, it will go ahead and create it and write this to the file. So we'll go ahead and run this and we see no output. And the demo2.txt was created over here. We'll go ahead and click on it and see hello world's in here. But if we go back into our file and try running it again, it does throw an error saying the file exists. And so this can be useful when you don't want to override an already existing file. So one way you can write this is inside a try except block. Inside the try indention, we have the with open in create mode as we had before. And then we're accepting this file exists error saying that the file already exists. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that the file already exists and that way it won't end the program. And we can continue on with whatever else we want our program to do. And so if you do need to open a file in binary mode, we can pass this B here right next to this R. You can do the same thing for writing. You can just have write B. You can have WB or AB or XB. But we'll leave it as RB for now. And we'll go ahead and run this. And we can see that it does print out the string that is inside the file with a B in front of it, meaning that it is in binary mode. And so here I've created a folder and just named it folder. And I've moved the demo.txt file inside of it. So if we do try running it like this, we can see that it cannot find the directory or file. So in order to get around this, you can either provide just folder, since that's what I named it, forward slash demo.txt, and run this so we see it works. Or you can provide a dot forward slash, just meaning the current directory. And it also does the same thing. And if we wanted to go up a directory, we would do dot dot forward slash. So there might be a situation where you're reading from a file and it contains emojis. So if we take a look at our demo.txt file, and we can see we have this rocket ship emoji in here. If we head back to our files.py file, in here we're just opening up the file in read mode, and we're getting the content of the file and printing it out. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that it prints out this is a list, appended text, and it has these weird symbols here. This is because it's not encoding the emoji correctly. So we can see in our demo.txt file, this rocket ship emoji turned into these characters. There actually is a way we can get this to print out emojis instead of these weird characters. And so we can do that by coming up to our open function and providing an optional argument called encoding. And we set it to UTF-8. And doing this will convert this strange set of characters into our actual emoji. So whenever we go ahead and run this, we can see that our emoji was actually printed. So cool. Thank you so much for watching this full course. If you made it this far, then that means you are so much closer to becoming a programming wizard. Leave a like, comment, and subscribe for more programming tutorials. And check out my channel to see what else Python can do. And I will see you in the next one.